Let's look at uh, the comparisons between an atom and an ion. Okay, atoms we refer to things that are neutral. Okay, the positives, the protons equal the electrons. Ions refer to charged uh, atoms. Okay, atoms that carry a charge. So if we have an ion, it means that they have either lost electrons or they have gained electrons. We will not lose or gain protons. Okay, we lose gain or we lose or we gain electrons only. Alkali metals contain one valence electron. They are considered very unstable. So what does an alkali metal have to do to achieve a stable state? So it's only got one valence electron. We can tell that because, remember, alkali metals are part of group one. Right? They're in, only in group one. Right? So if they're in group one, one valence electron. So let's look at... Uh, an alkaline metal that is in group one. So we have sodium. The atomic number of sodium is 11. So how many positives do we have? Well, we've got 11 positives, which mean we have how many electrons? We have to have 11 electrons because we are looking at sodium in terms of a neutral atom. So we look at sodium. Sodium ha is in um, group one, so because it's in group one, it's got, you're gonna see, we're gonna see only one valence. We are in period three, so because we're in period three, we're gonna have three orbitals, or three shells that are surrounding it. Notice here, one, two, three orbitals, okay? So, we're gonna label the uh, nucleus with Na. Because I am labeling the nucleus, with the symbol. This is what we call a Bohr diagram. Because Bohr said these electrons do not just circle around randomly, they are at energy levels around the nucleus. Right? There is nothing labeled in the nucleus with reference to Rutherford's work. Right? So we are just labeling it with the, uh, the symbol. So let's draw the electrons. We can only fit two maximum on the first shell, right? We need to fill in nine more, right? So from this, the 11 electrons, I've already drawn in two. I can only fit two in the first shell, right? Which means now I'm down to nine, right? I can only fit eight more on the next shell, which means my 11th one, right? My 11th one is that one valence electron. Right? So, for atoms to be stable, the outermost shell needs to be filled. Right? It needs to... See, by having that one, it's, kinda, it's got a lonely electron. It really does not want to be there. Right? So what happens? For it to be stable, sodium to become stable it has to do one of two things. We can fill in this orbital. Right? It's got one there. We can fill it in by putting seven more. Right? Or we can remove that one rid of that one because the inside shell is already full. So what is more likely to happen? Is it more likely to find seven electrons floating around to join this atom? Or is it easier to just lose an electron? And it's easier to just get rid of one than try to find um, seven electrons around. So we're going to get rid of that one. right? But now, what is the count of protons to Electrons. It used to be 11 to 11. But now if we count the number of electrons, we have more electrons than we have protons. Right? So how many more? One more. So that means the charge is plus one. So now it's no longer sodium. Oops. It's no longer sodium. It's now a sodium ion. So this is now a sodium ion. It is no longer a sodium atom. It is no longer a sodium atom because there's a difference between the number of protons and the number of electrons. Let's look at magnesium. 
Magnesium has an atomic number of 12. So it's the next atom in uh, the periodic table, right? So because we've got uh, the atomic number of 12, we're gonna have 12 protons, right? So because we have 12 protons, because this is a magnesium atom, it will also have 12 electrons. It's gonna be neutral, right? Because this is a magnesium atom that we're gonna draw. So we're gonna start off with a magnesium atom. So if we look at magnesium, right? Magnesium group two, so two valence electrons. Right? Two valence electrons. We are in period three, so three orbitals or three shells or three energy levels. Okay, so let's label the uh, the nucleus with magnesium. So this is a Bohr diagram, right? This is a Bohr diagram because we are not referencing Rutherford in this diagram. So we want to draw 12 electrons. How many can we fit in the first shell? Two. That's the maximum. So now we have to draw 10 more. But how many can we fit on the second orbital? Eight more, right? So there are, are eight. Now we have a total of 10, which means we have now what's left to draw our two valence electrons. And those are going to be on the outside. One, two. So for magnesium to become stable, has, it needs to do one of two things. It needs to either lose those two electrons or gain six electrons. So which one is more energetically favorable to happen, right? It's more likely to lose those two electrons. So let's get rid of them, bye-bye. Now our count is no longer 12 to 12. We have 10 electrons. So which do we have more of, electrons or protons? Well, we have more protons, right, than we have electrons. How many more? We've got two more. So the charge that's associated with magnesium is magnesium plus two. So now this is no longer a magnesium atom because it's got a charge. This is now a magnesium ion because it has a plus two charge. Now, let's look on the opposite side of the periodic table. We're looking at the uh, metals. Notice how with these ones, magnesium that we worked on and sodium, right? These were metals. These were metals. Now, moving across the periodic table, we are going to look at fluorine, which is a non-metal. And we're gonna see something different actually uh, happens here. So let's look at the atomic number. The atomic number of fluorine is nine which means we have how many protons in the nucleus? We're gonna have nine protons. Because this is a fluorine atom, right? It's neutral, it will have nine electrons. No charge, right? Atoms, no charge, equal amount. So let's draw our uh, orbitals. Now, we know we are in, um, uh, if you look at, um, at fluorine, fluorine is in group 17. So therefore, seven valence electrons. Right? Seven valence electrons we're going to have. Uh, we are in period okay, number two. Right. So because we're in period number two, we are only going to have two shells. So I've drawn a third one, so we know we're going to ignore this shell. Right. So let's start to draw it. Okay, we're drawing a Bohr diagram, right? We've got fluorine in the center, or in the nucleus, right? So, Bohr diagram. And we need to draw nine electrons. So, we start off from the inner shell, the first shell. We can only fit two. So we have seven more electrons that we can fit. The second shell can only fit up to eight. So we know we can fit all seven in that outer shell. Now, we have a total of nine electrons, seven valence electrons, right? As we said, seven valence electrons. This is the outermost shell right here, right? The ones with the seven. So for fluorine to become stable, it has one of two options. It can either lose all seven of these electrons, 
or it can pick up only one electron. What is more likely to happen? Right? And we think about what happened with the metals. Metals gave up, right? We looked at sodium, we looked at magnesium, they gave up one or even two electrons, which means these nonmetals must be the ones that actually pick those up. So these nonmetals are going to pick up the electrons that the metals have given up. Right? So it's going to gain one electron. There it is. Who knows who it picked it up from? It could have picked it up from the magnesium we did in the previous example. It could have been picked up from the sodium. It could have been from any metal on the metal side. Could have given it up. So now, the count used to be nine protons, nine electrons. But now, look at the difference. We have extra electrons. So which means the protons are less than the number of electrons. How much less? They're less by one which means the charge for fluorine is a negative one charge. So now we don't no longer have a fluorine atom. We have a fluorine ion. But now, here's the, the trick now with uh, nonmetals. With nonmetals, there is a name change. And the name change is as follows. Oops. The INE gets dropped for IDE. So we don't refer to it as a fluorine ion. We refer to it as a fluoride. So if you were asked to draw a fluoride, right, or a fluoride atom, we're referring to the ion version of fluorine. Okay, so nonmetals will drop their ending to I, D, E. So let's look at sulfur. Atomic number for sulfur is 16. Okay, so which means we have 16 protons. And because we are looking at it in terms of a sulfur atom, we will also have 16 uh, electrons. Now... If we look at sulfur, right, it is in group number um, 16, which means we drop the one, so we have six valence electrons. Right? We are in period number three, which means we have three orbitals, or three shells, or three energy levels. So here we have, so in the nucleus, we're drawing a Bohr diagram, so we're just gonna put the S, okay? So we're gonna draw our electrons. So how many can fit in the first? We need to draw a total of 16 electrons. So two will fit in the first shell, eight more on the second, total of 10, which means I have six more electrons I need to account for, and they are gonna go in the next orbital. And there's, the, um, the six more valence electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. These are the electrons on the outermost shell. So now for sulfur to become stable, one of two things can happen, right? We can either pick up two electrons or we can get rid of these six. Most likely to happen, remember, it's on the nonmetal side. Nonmetals have a tendency to gain electrons. So it's more likely to gain two electrons. Let's add them, one, two there, right? Now this count is no longer the same. It's not 16 and 16. It's actually still 16 protons because remember, this never changes, right? Because where do we get this? We get that from here, right? That's where that comes from. It never changes. So we've got 18 negatives, right? We've got less protons than we have electrons. How many, how much less? We have two less, which means the charge for sulfur is negative two. So now it's no longer a sulfur atom. It is a sulfur ion or a sulfide, IDE representing ion. Okay, so it's a sulfur ion or a sulfide. So please make sure you can uh, identify the difference.
So, difference between an atom and an ion. So let's just kind of recap. So, let's look at the two. Is there a difference? Here's a sodium atom, here's a sodium atom. Right? Here's a, so they're both sodium atoms. Right? But now, let's see what we're going to do different with this one. Watch what we're going to do. Get rid of that electron. Now we have a plus one. So now we no longer have a sodium atom, we have a sodium ion. Right? Ions will have a full valence shell. This is now the valence shell because it's the one that's full. It's the outermost shell. This shell no longer exists. Okay, that energy level, we're gonna ignore it for these Bohr diagrams. Okay, so notice we've gotten rid of the one valence electron that we've seen. Let's look at magnesium, right? We were, we were able to remove two electrons. So, magnesium atom and a magnesium ion. Notice again, full valence shell, but now it's the inner, one of the next, the shells inside. It lost those two electrons. It picked up this plus two charge now because it lost electrons, right? Magnesium ion. So, magnesium metal, lose electrons. When metals become ions, they are called cations. And as we said, think about the T for what kind of ions? Positive ions, right? Cations are ions that are positively charged, therefore sodium atom becomes a sodium ion, a magnesium atom becomes a magnesium ion. There is no name change. Let's look at the opposite side of the periodic table. Here we have two atoms of fluorine. They are both exactly identical. These are fluorine atoms. Now, let's see what happens. We just gained an electron, right? Let's watch it again. Here it is. Because it's picked up an electron. Remember, electrons carry a negative charge. We've got more negatives than we have positives, right? You gotta still look at the atomic number, right? So we have the negative. We've picked up an extra negative. So now, we have no longer a fluorine atom. We've got, the first one is a fluorine atom. The second one is a fluoride ion, or a fluorine ion, right? Notice here, this name change. The I, D, E, four non-metals. So, as we said, notice the IDE ending for non-metals. Non-metals gain electrons to become stable, therefore they become negatively charged. When they do so, they are called anions. So we think about the N for negative. Right? Negative charge, anions. Okay, so non-metals become anions when they become charged, when they end up gaining the electrons. And an IDE ending is placed when naming it. So now, what do we do with something like oxygen? Right? Oxygen is gonna gain two electrons. So it's not oxygenide. Oxygen, when it becomes an ion, becomes oxide. Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Right? When it gains the electrons, it becomes not phosphoride, it becomes phosphide when it becomes the ion. So here are a couple of practice questions. Uh, you can refer to the answers. There's an interactive uh, periodic table on E-Class. Uh, please send me an email if you can access the E-Class and would like um, the, um, the periodic table. I, I've created for the first 20 elements on E-Class uh, a PowerPoint. Just click and, you know, click and play kind of thing. So you'll have the first 20 elements, you click on them, and it will give you all the answers for Bohr diagrams, Bohr-Rutherford diagrams, ion versions, electron dot diagrams, you name it, it should have it.